The Dirt with me, Mike Howell, an economics podcast where I present the down and dirty agronomic science to help grow crops and bottom lines. Inspired by economics.com, farming's go-to informational resource, I'm here to break down the latest crop nutrition research, news, and issues, helping farmers make better business decisions through actionable insights. Let's dig in. Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to The Dirt. The Dirt is being brought to you this week from Edinburgh, Scotland. We are here at the Sulphur World Symposium this week. I've got quite a full lineup this week. They are having the first ever agronomy session here at the Sulphur World Symposium. We've got agronomists from all over the world that are going to be talking about the importance of sulphur and sulphur uses in crops. We hope to bring you some summaries of these presentations over the course of the next two episodes. We'll begin this week and continue that episode on into next week. So stay tuned and hope you get some information out of this about sulfur and sulfur nutrition. Our first guest today is going to be Ron Olson with the Sulfur Institute. For our listeners that have been tuning in regularly, you probably remember the episode we did on sulfur last year. We had Ron last year with us. He told us a little bit about the Sulfur Institute and what they do. Ron, welcome back to the dirt. It's great to be back. I appreciate the invitation. Ron, if you will, remind our listeners a little bit about the Sulphur Institute and what y'all are working on there at the Sulphur Institute. The Sulphur Institute is uh, based in Washington, D.C. We're a trade organization to support the sulphur industry. TSI, as we are referred to as our three letters, the Sulphur Institute has been operating for 60 years. We have 60 member companies globally, and we represent and work with companies that are mining sulfur or capturing it in a recycling effort at a refinery or just involved in the production of taking sulfur and using it to manufacture fertilizers or turn it into sulfuric acid because sulfuric acid is probably the most important chemical that we have globally to do so many things in the industrial capacity. And it takes people to market these products and it takes people to transport these products, safely handle them. There's a lot of connection from the standpoint of all the different companies that supply parts and things. So we're a diverse trade organization that supports sulfur needs around the world. You and I are both agronomists and we talk a good bit about the need for sulfur and plant nutrition. But uh, one of the things I've learned here at the sulfur meetings over the last couple of years is sulfur has a lot of other uses that I wasn't really familiar with. One thing that I've picked up on is the need for sulfur in some of our batteries and, and the production of batteries lately. There's a lot of things that go along with sulfur. Absolutely. And with the need for EV cars and trucks and tractors, etc., the need for sulfur to continue to be an important part of that, to develop those lithium batteries or the other types of new batteries being developed, sulfur is going to play a very key role in the future of electrical vehicles. Today, we're going to focus more on the agronomy aspect. I think that's what most of our listeners are tuning in for. Here at the Sulphur World Symposium, you've had the Agronomy Steering Committee active for a few years now and getting that back in operation. And one of the tasks that you accomplished this year was the Agronomy Symposium, and you brought in some speakers from around the world to talk about sulfur. If you would, tell us a little bit about that part of the symposium. I'm happy to talk about that. This is an effort that the members of the Agronomy Steering Committee suggested right after our Tampa Symposium in May of 2022. And they said as a group, well, why don't we think about having an expanded agronomy series of meetings so we can tell the story about the importance of sulfur and why it really is the fourth major crop nutrient. So we went to work. And as it turned out, we have five excellent speakers that are on the panel yesterday. We were so fortunate to have all five of them present, uh, Dr. Ishmael Kakmak from Sabansi University in Istanbul, Turkey, Dr. Malcolm Hoxford from Rothamsted. We had Dr. Shami Zingor from the African Plant Nutrition Institute educating us about the need for sulfur, and it's a big need for sulfur in the African continent, very critical actually. And then Dr. Rob Mickelson from Yara, Director of Agronomy for Yara, was speaking, as well as Dr. Alan Blaylock with Nutrien, 
uh, those five gentlemen represented, I didn't add up the years, but there's a lot of years of experience there about the importance of crop nutrition and the role that sulfur plays. So we had a chance to have them all in one room in a concentrated time. And for me, it was like eating a big roast beef sandwich. It was great to sit and hear what they have been doing research on and how their science and their story is going to help the Sulfur Institute really back up the statement, sulfur is the fourth major crop nutrient, and we're going to expand our efforts to do that. Ron, that was quite an impressive lineup. We really enjoyed listening to those talks, and we're going to try to get each one of those speakers on the program today and let them summarize their talks for our listeners here today. Ron, one thing that you mentioned was sulfur is the fourth major crop nutrient. That's something that's been presented a lot here this week. If you will, talk a little bit more about that. Why the need for sulfur and the fourth major crop nutrient? When being an agronomist who's been in the industry over almost 50 years now, we are well trained that the nutrients NPK are so critically important. The fact though, is that balanced crop nutrition is where it is. That's where we're going to get the most efficiency and the best bang for our buck as farmers make their investment in their crop nutrition plans. But just yesterday, when we were listening to these five speakers, they helped us understand that sulfur is inside so many different reactions inside the plant to move nutrients from the soil into the plant. I'll just say this. I had missed the importance of how sulfur helps plants trigger the stomata to, when it's under drought conditions, to save water. I always related that to potassium being so critical. Well, potassium is a driver of that, but sulfur triggers the whole process. I missed that, or maybe I was never taught that. So that's why this drilling down deep with these excellent scientists is helping us to see more completely how sulfur, the roles that it plays. And people have said sulfur is the forgotten nutrient. I think it was for a long time. And the Sulfur Institute wants to help create opportunities for that to no longer be the case. And we're going to be at it for a good while. We believe that we all learn through spaced repetition. So I'm going to keep repeating sulfur is the fourth major crop nutrient. People might hear me say, well, stop that. But we're going to keep at it. And that's an important aspect of what we do. That's exactly right, Ron. You know, you mentioned that sulfur is referred to as the forgotten nutrient, and we all know with the Clean Air Act, that kind of cleaned up our environment, and that was a great act. We had to do that, but because of that, we're not getting the free sulfur we used to, and sulfur is coming to the forefront because of that, and I think these speakers did a great job and brought forth that information. Ron, not everybody could travel to Edinburgh to be here for this meeting. I know it's quite out of the way for everybody to get here, but I do also know that y'all recorded all of these presentations. Is that going to be available for people that weren't able to travel to Edinburgh? Can they go somewhere and see that information? They will be able to. We we have a task ahead of us to take those videos and link them with the slide presentations. I'm excited to work with our videographer who's spent the day with us to do that. I would say, give me two months to work through those. And yes, we have not figured out how best to distribute them. But Mike, I think you're going to be willing to help us distribute those and tell that story. That'll be great. And as soon as those are available, we'll let everybody know where to go and see those. We may even get a link to those for the economics website. So our listeners are quite accustomed to going to economics to find some more information. Ron, any other comments, anything you want to leave our listeners with before we wrap this segment up? The thing that I would say about our agronomy steering committee is that the TSI is fortunate to have these 12 member companies working together to share their expertise about crop nutrition and the importance of sulfur. And this particular week has been great to knit those relationships closer together. We knew we didn't get all of our 12 members of our committee here because of other business obligations, but we're very excited to keep working on this and keep listening to the dirt. We'll keep you posted. Thanks, Ron. We really appreciate it. I'm joined now by Dr. Sammy Zingori. Dr. Zingori is head of the African Plant and Nutrition Institute. Dr. Zingori, thanks for taking a few minutes to join us today and talk about what you're doing there in Africa. It's a great pleasure to be part of this podcast. Thank you very much for having me today. Before we get started, if you would, take just a few minutes and introduce yourself to us and tell us what you're working on. My name is Shemi Sungore. I am a soil scientist by training. I specialize in soil fertility, and there's a field of soil science that addresses the ability of the soils to support crop production and ensure that crops receive the right nutrients that they need to produce the optimal yields that are achievable. That sounds like quite a task to undertake, and we appreciate the efforts you're having down there. 
Dr. Zingori, in, in your presentation today, you started off your presentation talking about plant nutrition is at the core of ag sustainability in Africa. Agriculture sustainability is something that we spent a lot of time talking about last season, and we know that sustainability is different depending on who's talking about sustainability, but we definitely support the efforts of sustainability. You also mentioned uh, things like low and unbalanced nutrient applications and some problems that that's leading to. Uh, if you would elaborate on that a little more. Speaking from the African context, Africa lags behind in fertilizer use when we compare with other global regions. Just to put the numbers into perspective, current fertilizer use in Africa averages just about 20 kgs of nutrients per hectare. And that's only about 20% of the global average fertilizer use. So Africa has this 80% deficit in fertilizer use and that also translates into a large deficit in youth production because currently yields in Africa for the major food crops such as maize, rice and wheat are about one and a half tons per hectare and that's a third of the global average yields which are average about uh, five tons per hectare. So that's why attention to increased nutrient use and also ensuring that we are achieving a balance in the nutrient use is very, very fundamental if Africa is going to increase the overall productivity of agriculture. We all know the importance of increasing those yields and the productivity. Another point that you mentioned was the low fertility levels that led to the low yields and land degradation. Another result of that is malnutrition and poverty. We understand that it's important to get these nutrients out there and get these yield levels up uh, so that we're not affecting the, the nutrition and the poverty of the population of Africa. Absolutely. Essentially, for us to get the right food in the right quality, we have to pay attention to feeding the crops well. And this is where the whole concept of plant nutrition comes in, by providing sufficient nutrients in their correct balance, we are able to not only increase the crop yields, but also increase the quality of the crops that are produced. And that means that a better fertilized crop has higher levels of nutrients and that required to ensure that the population that consumes the food produced in Africa is accessing highly nutritional food. So I just wanted to emphasize that the large part of the food security problem that we have in Africa where about 300 million people suffer from malnutrition is very much related to low yields and low quality of the food produced due to low and unbalanced uh, nutrient application. Another point you made, you showed some data slides and one of the slides showed that you were able to document a 20% yield gain with only the addition of NP and K and that's not including all the micronutrients. 20% yield gain is quite impressive. So talk a little bit more about the 20% yield gain. On average conditions, the problem of low crop productivity, which is largely due to low nutrient application, but a lot of the research work we've done on the continent shows that we can readily increase yields when we supply nutrients in their correct balance. So just by addressing nutrient management, we found in our work that we can increase crop yields by 20%. We are talking about just moving from 20 kgs of nutrient per hectare to 50 kgs of nutrient per hectare. And that's a major yield gain that can be achieved. And that would go a long way in meeting the food deficits that the continent has. You talked about why sulfur was so low in Africa and the problems it was caused by the low sulfur fertility. If you would speak a few minutes about those conditions. Essentially, the issue of sulfur deficiency is expressed in the yields. And I did mention that we can readily increase yields by adding NPK. And when sulfur and other micronutrients are addressed, we can further double productivity. So that's an important part of achieving higher yields and higher quality crops by ensuring that we apply nutrients in their correct balance, including sulfur. And in the case of sulfur, we you have a major issue with sulfur deficiencies, which is very pervasive across the continent. And that's largely because of the low inherent 
availability of sulfur in the soils. And this is because soils in Africa, some of the oldest in the world, they are highly weathered and they have very low organic matter. And the large part of the sulfur available in the soils is supplied through organic matter. And then the second dimension is for many decades, a large part of the African continent has been cropped with insufficient sulfur application. And almost every year, farmers remove about three kgs of sulfur from the soil. And for many decades, the removal of sulfur has culminated in very low sulfur contents, which constrain the yields that farmers can achieve, which makes sulfur fertilization an imperative investment to increase productivity. Dr. Zingori, we sure appreciate you taking time to visit with us today. I look forward to seeing you around at dinner tonight and hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. It's been a great pleasure to be part of uh, the seminar today and a lot of the efforts and some of the discussions are very insightful in what Africa can do to overcome the sulfur deficiency in the soils on the continent. Our next guest is Dr. Rob Mickelson. Rob is Director of Agronomy with Yara and has been around the agronomy world and soil science world for quite a long time. Rob, thanks for being with us today. Mike, glad to be with you and discuss some of these important issues that often get overlooked. Rob, if you will, before we get started, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do. I know we met years ago back when you were working with IP&I, and I know you've had a couple of role changes since then, so let our listeners know a little bit about you. Thanks, Mike. I'm a soil scientist, and that's really my first love, but I've worked for the U.S. government for a number of years. I worked at North Carolina State University as a professor. I joined a nonprofit called the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and that later took me to living in Africa for several years. And then most recently, I'm working for Yara, which is a large international fertilizer company. We've talked a lot about this over the course of the DIRT, the 4R Nutrient Management Program, and you were quite instrumental in the development of this program back in your days with IP&I. Talk a little bit about that, if you will. Thanks, Mike. That's one of the things I think I'm really proud of being a part of is this 4R Nutrient Stewardship concept. We needed a framework to improve the way we're managing nutrients, and this 4R concept arose and we felt like this was a great way to have conversations related to nutrient management, both on a very simple way, something that everyone could relate to about using the right source, right rate, right time and place of fertilizer. But you can get into quite a lot of depth on each of those topics. And you've talked about those on your podcast, but you can spend hours or days talking about each one of those. So you can talk about it at a very educational, almost a very simple level to apply it to a farm situation where you can get very deep into the science. I think it meets a lot of needs, something we can communicate to the public that we're doing a better job of managing our nutrients in a very conscientious and a very targeted way. That's right, Rob. Uh, We've got to manage these nutrients and make sure that we're protecting the environment at the same time. We don't want to be unnecessarily applying these nutrients where we don't need them. Let's move in and talk a little bit about your presentation here at the Sulphur Symposium. One of the first things I got out of your talk yesterday was uh, you talked about nutrient interactions, and we've talked about that a little bit on the program, but that's a subject we really haven't dived into that deep. Most of the time when I think about interactions, I think about the positive side, but you also pointed out that there are some negative interactions as well. So if you will, talk a little bit about the interactions you spoke about yesterday. Plants have developed a very complex set of mechanisms where they can regulate their nutrient concentration. So just like in a human body, it's not surprising that if you change one thing, something else is often changed. High blood pressure, for example, can change lots of other things within our body. Sometimes we do things that are beneficial for our body. Sometimes they're not beneficial and can be harmful in the long run. So many of the plant nutrients are like that too. When we change one nutrient in the plant, it impacts another one. Some of the ones we commonly think about are phosphorus and zinc. Those have a negative interaction. With high phosphorus, sometimes we can induce a zinc deficiency. So the one that we spent most of our time talking about yesterday was sulfur and nitrogen. Those are very closely related in amino acid production and then in protein production. So a lack of nitrogen causes the sulfur not to be used properly, or a lack of sulfur causes the nitrogen not to be used properly. It's one of those that you can't just only add nitrogen or only add sulfur, but you need the right combination of both of those to be effective for plant health. 
Rob, I don't know if you listen to the dirt that often, but a couple of weeks ago we had Dr. Glenn Harris with the University of Georgia on talking about cotton and peanut fertility. And that's one of the things he mentioned was the nitrogen and sulfur ratio and how important that was, in, especially in cotton production. Is that true in most crops that we're talking about? I think it's every crop we talk about. And how that interaction manifests itself may be different in different crops. Sometimes, for example, in nitrogen-fixing plants, could be beans or peas or peanuts, could be lots of things. And nitrogen and sulfur is especially shows up in the nitrogen fixation. Those rhizobia are not able to function properly. And then the nitrogen that they do fix doesn't get assimilated into the plant properly. But we see it in other crops, for example, in canola, that's another one that has a fairly high sulfur demand. And if there's not proper sulfur, the yields are severely suppressed. And also the oil ratios are not what we want when that nitrogen and sulfur ratio is correct. And it shows up in wheat. Not only are yields suppressed when there's not adequate sulfur, but the baking quality of the flour that comes from the wheat where there's insufficient sulfur is diminished and the loaves of bread don't rise properly. It's essential for every crop. It's just the way that it's manifested may be different in different crops. And that was something else I was going to bring up. You talked about the increased yield with the proper ratios of nitrogen and sulfur. You mentioned the baking quality. Another thing that you mentioned yesterday was the fertilizer recovery from the soil, if we have this ratio correct. Talk a little bit more about that. Again, these interactions are so important in everything that we do and often get overlooked. This ratio of nitrogen and sulfur need to be preserved in the plant, and often it ranges between 12 parts of nitrogen to one part sulfur, maybe up to 16 parts per million of nitrogen to one part sulfur. When that ratio is disturbed, maybe if there's a surplus of nitrogen or deficiency of sulfur, or maybe a surplus of sulfur and deficiency of nitrogen, when those ratios are off, the plant metabolism just doesn't function properly. So we put on our nitrogen fertilizer, following good recommendations, following the 4R practices, but sulfur is deficient, the plant can't take up that nitrogen and it can't use that nitrogen properly. And a number of studies have showed that applying nitrogen fertilizer with a deficiency of sulfur, that nitrogen stays in the soil. And with all the environmental talk that we have, and Mike, you've addressed this in the past, we don't want nitrogen staying in the soil, not being taken up by the plant. When it stays in the soil and we get a rainfall, that can be lost through leaching down into groundwater, and that's a concern in some of our agricultural areas. When that nitrate stays in the soil and we get, a again, maybe a flooded condition, we can lose that nitrogen through denitrification. A lot of ways we don't think about the soil when we're doing the fertilizer. We're thinking about plant nutrition, but a lack of sulfur causes that nitrogen to remain in the soil and not be taken up, and then there can be some unintended environmental consequences that we're trying to avoid. One thing that you did point out was when we have the adequate sulfur, you talked about reducing the nitrate leaching, you talked about the nitrous oxides reduction a little bit, and you also talked about as much as 15% increased nitrogen recovery. That's something that I hadn't thought about for a while. That Again, it shouldn't have been surprising to me, but all of these things are related. A deficiency of one nutrient causes a disruption in the metabolism in another. And Mike, you've seen and talked about the the barrel example, which we use commonly in soil fertility, where the stave of one that's the shortest limits the nutrient efficiency of the other nutrients. And this is a basic concept we learned probably in the first day of our agronomy training. And I'm not sure why it took me so many years to relearn that, but when sulfur is deficient, nothing else is going to be used properly. And that includes zinc, it includes some of the micronutrients, it includes nitrogen, which we're talking about today. But all of these things have to be managed properly and we have to get away from our focus of one single nutrient at a time. And so today it was a good reminder that we need to consider sulfur because that's one of the nutrients that often gets overlooked. We think about N, P, and K, often the micronutrients, but sulfur just sort of hangs out there in the background and often doesn't get the attention that it needs. That's exactly right, Rob. One other thing that you talked about, different ways that we could lose sulfur from the system. And we don't think about that an awful lot, but we can lose sulfur much like we do nitrogen. Talk a little bit about how sulfur can be lost and how we can protect that sulfur and keep it in the system. 
Well, that depends very much on the soil, of course, but we find that in most soils, the majority of the sulfur is tied up in organic matter. And that's very similar to nitrogen, where we know we're going to get some mineralization of soil organic matter every year, and a small amount of that nitrogen will be released for the plant. Very similar to that is the sulfur. The sulfur is tied up in organic matter and that slowly is mineralized by soil microorganisms. They estimate that up to 99% of the total sulfur in the soil is present in organic matter. So every year that's leaking a little bit of sulfur in, into the soil solution. And generally there's just a few parts per million of sulfate, which is the form the plants take up, in the soil solution available for plant nutrition. So. The soil organic matter is slowly breaking down and maybe slowly building as well as we try to build soil carbon, but that sulfate behaves very similarly to nitrate. And it's well known that nitrate will leach out of most soils. The cations are held tightly on the cation exchange sites, but the anions generally are not held onto the soil particles or soil organic matter. Similar to nitrate, sulfate is very susceptible to leaching. And that's probably one of the biggest loss mechanisms is washing it through the soil down below the root zone. In very acidic soils, the soil properties change somewhat, and in acid soils, the sulfate can actually bind to the soil particles, but that's not at a pH range that we try to grow our crops. You know, that's down at pH 5 or 4 or even 3. The sulfate can be adsorbed out of the soil, but at that pH, it's very harmful for the roots to grow because of aluminum toxicity primarily. So a large amount of this sulfur fertilizer that we apply eventually will get washed out below the root zone. When this happens with nitrate, we're very concerned because nitrate has some big implications for water quality, whether it's for drinking or maybe stimulating algae growth or doing some unintended consequence. With sulfate, we don't really worry about the environmental aspects of sulfate leaching like we do with nitrate. With sulfate, one of the biggest concerns is when it gets to a high concentration, the water tastes funny. And I think we've all experienced water where there's some sulfur there and we're going, mm, it doesn't taste like I would like it to. At very high concentrations of sulfate in drinking water, it starts to cause some stomach upset, but no real serious harmful impacts like nitrate does. So we don't really talk much about the environmental impacts of that sulfate leaching from the soil like we do with nitrate. But like anything, we're applying fertilizer. We want to get as much of it in the plant as we can. We don't want it to wash below the root zone. So going back to the 4R discussion that we began with, 4R practices of managing that source rate time and place can allow us to get the most sulfur into the plant just like there is to get the most nitrogen into the plant. Rob, we really appreciate you taking time to visit with us today. I'm sure our growers are getting a lot of useful information from this. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap this up? Mike, I really appreciate your efforts to educate people about using nutrients in the best way. Sometimes fertilizers get some disparaging words about why do farmers use all this fertilizer and what about some of the negative things about fertilizer, but really there's no single invention in the world beyond mineral fertilizers that have done more to benefit the human family, to raise people out of poverty, to provide good nutrition, to eliminate hunger. Yes, there are some problems with fertilizers and we have a long way to go to managing them best way, but they have been such a tremendous blessing for humanity. And I get a little defensive sometimes when people only talk about the negative things and overlook the great benefit that they are for the world. So I appreciate your efforts to educate people, Mike, and help us do a better job, but to appreciate this miracle that we have in modern agriculture. Thank you, Rob. I'll let you get back to the conference now. We really appreciate you stopping by. Well, listeners, we're now ready for our second segment today. And if you've been listening, you recognize that we're going to start talking about our famous person in agriculture. Today, since we're in the United Kingdom, I thought it would only be fitting that we talk about somebody from the United Kingdom and their contributions to agriculture. The person we're going to talk about today is Jethro Tull. He was from Berkshire, England. He lived from 1674 to 1741. He grew up on a farm, and later on in life, he actually took over his father's farm and farmed that for a while before purchasing his own farm. But in 1699, Tull had trained to be on the bar and actually passed all of those tests and 10 years later was called to be a lawyer. He chose not to do that and continued working on his father's farm. 
1701, he actually invented a horse-drawn seed drill that was an economical way to sow seeds into neat rows and much like the grain drills that we still use today. This was a big advance over the way that grain was sown in the past where they actually just threw the seed out by hand. But this invention really revolutionized the way that grain was able to be planted and is still used much to this same method today. So today we want to thank Mr. Jethro Tull for his contributions to the grain drill. Well, listeners, we hope you enjoyed this first session from the Sulphur World Symposium. We'll be coming back next week and bring you the conclusion of this episode with more information from the speakers this week. Until next time, this has been Mike Howell with The Dirt.